You are listening to the Business of Social Podcast powered by STN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. Each and every program, we dive into the ever-changing social digital marketing landscape. This episode is no different. We continue our panel series, and producer Will, I know a category that is near and dear to your heart. This panel will be the beauty space. Thank you for the uh, compliment. I'll take that. <laughs> of course. Um, you know, so, and I know... We spoke with both Aaron um, and Hannah a couple of weeks ago and, and met them and two amazing um, women in the space, marketers in the space. I'm really excited to, to get to know more and, and really get some knowledge for our listeners. Uh, they work for a company called Way. I know a lot of you know about this brand. It's in Sephora. It was actually originally launched by Jen Adkin, and she did the hair for what will? Kim Kardashian and Kendall Jenner, Haley Bieber. Um, and was an international hairstylist for years. And then she, back in 2016, launched Way. Um, and, you know, it'll be interesting to hear from Hannah too, because Hannah was there almost from the get-go, one of the first employees, and she's now the VP of brand marketing. But I'm excited because they do a really good job. Well, I know you and I were kind of ooing and eyeing over their social media strategy because, you know, we've talked so much on this program about building a community, being genuine to the audience, uh, making sure you're providing value to your consumer. And they just do a really, really good job of that. I think they have a really good outlook, or I guess philosophy, I should say, on what they want their social to do, how they want it to look, and what the, the purpose of that is. And I think a lot of people will get value here in kind of how they set themselves up for success. On social. Yeah. And I think any, no matter what you do, whether you work in um, sports, entertainment, products, food and beverage, beauty, um, I'm really excited for them to just kind of give their thoughts. We haven't really dove so deep into building communities. And I think on this yeah. episode, I want to make sure we do that because it just, I mean, it correlates to every single uh, vertical, every single brand um, out there. So again, um, I'm excited with a guy with no hair to dive into the hair care industry. Uh, you know, so it's going to be fun, <laughs> of course. So Hannah and Aaron coming up from Way. Uh, this is going to be an exciting one. I hope you guys enjoy it. All right, so excited uh, for yet another panel series right here on the Business of Social podcast. Uh, we have two amazing women from the uh, hair care brand Way, and I'm so excited to get into this as we've talked about you know, the beauty and lifestyle and everything that goes into this category, and I'm super excited. So Hannah and Aaron, thank you so much for your time. I will start with uh, Hannah. Can, do you mind just giving the, the audience a quick rundown of your role and what you ever see day to day? Yeah. Um, so I'm Hannah. I'm the vice president of brand marketing at Way. I've been with the company since almost the beginning. So it's been a really fun journey watching the brand evolve. Um, and my team basically looks after all of the creative um, production of shoots and conception of shoots and, you know, all of that stuff that you see outward facing of the brand, as well as our social media channels, our communications and PR department, our events and our partnerships all fall um, within the brand marketing team. And you, like four years, right? You were one of the first ever employees over at Way. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then I'll throw it to you, Aaron. Uh, you're the rookie of the squad, I guess you can say. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I'm Aaron Dwyer. I'm the VP of Digital at Way. I have been here a whopping nine months. Of those nine months, we've experienced some Precedent, unprecedented times, I think, that we're all experiencing. So it's definitely what been a an time to start. Yeah. Yeah. First nine months. But um, I run everything kind of from like the business commerce and on digital. So that's our the way.com. Um, we have an Amazon shop that we run. And then we also launched in China this year. And so all of that kind of rolls up. And then anything from like the performance marketing and search marketing, um, email, CRM, loyalty, all of that kind of rolls up into me. Awesome. You know, one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to both of you is you've done a really tremendous job and we'll get into this um, a little bit later, but just building a community and like a lifestyle brand within uh, what is, you know, what originally was product, right? And I think a lot of brands get that wrong where you look at their social media feed and it's just a bunch of pictures of the product and it's just a bunch of ad salesy material. And you guys have done a really good job, I think, of developing that community. So I'm excited to dig into that because I think a lot of people can get value out of that. But we talked a few weeks ago and we were kind of joking a little bit in the, in the beginning of this show where, or prior to the podcast, is, you know, COVID we thought was kind of this, you know, moment in time. And now it's really, it's, it's it, you know, we're in this now and it's probably going to be for the foreseeable future for sure. But I would love to start with Aaron. Um, 
being at the company for four years and this, you know, back in March, this happens, but asking a lot of people, what immediate challenges did you guys face that you, cause everybody had to pivot quickly. I'm going to, I haven't been there four years. Hannah has. Oh, Hannah. Sorry. Sorry. Gotcha. So I'll passion. start with Hannah. <laughs> um, I think for us, um, you know, one of the things that has made us very successful, um, especially with the community and the social aspect is that we are, um, like a very content driven brand. And we have a really like sharp in-house content team. Um, we're typically very agile and able to sh you know, shoot and pivot on a dime. And we have our own in-house content studio in the office mm -hmm. that we're always in, we're always shooting. So obviously COVID has thrown a wrench in the in-person content creation uh, piece of things. Um, and we rely so heavily on organic social and you know, um, social with our retail partners and, you know, content that we create with our ambassadors and network that they share out. So to be limited there, um, you know, is definitely a challenge and we thought it was going to be temporary. So we were kind of in this weird little limbo period where we're like, well, we'll, we'll take a month off from shooting. We'll use some content we have backlogged, but then we kind of yeah. reached a point where we were like, we need this, you know, content is our bread and butter and it, it sells our products as well as our brand identity to everyone that interacts with us. And so, we've had to pivot a bit um, to outsourcing a lot of content and working with creators um, to help us get the assets that we need. Um, and then we've also started recently doing a bit of social distance shooting, um, which comes with its own set of challenges. I mean, you can't have that yeah. many people that we have to cut back the hair and makeup squad, which makes things take a lot longer. Um, we can only have one model at a time. And so, mm. um, you know, things are just like, longer and slower um, to get done, um, but we're making it work. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's been hard on our team to not be as quick as we used to be and we like to be, um, but there's so many great digital content creators in the world right now. You can literally find someone for anything. Um, so to be able to have a good digital network to rely on too is, has been super helpful. And I think for the record, they're still really yeah. fast. I can't even <laughs> tell you how quick and how like, amazing that creative team is. And so with all this going on, the amount of content they've been able to get out has been mind blowing. And you guys, I mean, at least when this first hit, like March, April, like all 200 stores closed, right? More than 200. <laughs> More than 200. <laughs> A lot of stores um, closed. Yeah, so, um, cause you guys, and, and, and I, I use that as an example because I would love to, I mean, and this is more Aaron, probably in your world, because I know you oversee the Amazon side of the business. How, how did you guys see the increase in just DTC and people obviously, when you can't go into the store, you have to order online? Yeah, it's an interesting thing that um, a bunch of folks I talked to in the digital space have been discussing is, was it a moment in time, kind of like we thought COVID would be, or is right. it going to be a continued changed consumer behavior? So there was definitely this immediate April, May, you know, huge numbers, um, conversion on performance was unbelievably the best I've ever seen it. We were paying so little for customers, but how long was that really gonna sustain? Um, and so what we have seen is it did kind of, uh, it adjusted a little bit, but it is still much higher, I think, because of the mm -hmm. current behavior across most channels. So not just for way.com or Amazon, but also for Sephora.com and Alta.com right. and Nordstrom.com. And so they've all seen kind of this, this lift upward. Um, and I think the one element that did adjust it was when we went through June, which was a pivotal time, I think, in the country. Um, but as a brand, you know, Hannah and her team, you know, we all agreed to turn everything off. And so yeah. this came out of April and May, these kind of like big digital moments. But then we took a moment to really think about what this should be in this world and in this climate and uh, given more important things that needed to be discussed. So we've seen a huge shift um, to digital. I think if I had a, a crystal ball, I would say the mix of business will probably change for the foreseeable future because mm -hmm. we've now trained customers how to buy online and they're becoming That's more scary. comfortable, you know? Um, and how was that, I guess, prior to COVID for, what did you guys see? Like in terms of the percentage of people buying at your local store or online, like has that, has that flipped? Like, how have you seen those changes based on what it used to be? Yeah. I mean, I'll just talk in broad strokes yeah. generally for the industry versus like specific to our revenue, but it's usually a 70, 30 or an 80, 20 mix. Um, you know, you have huge footprints with Sephora stores and Altadors yeah. that, from a scaling perspective are always going to 
outweigh. So when you remove that and you see this pendulum swing to people who used to only, you know, my mom texted me yesterday, I want to go to a Sephora store for new makeup and she's never been to one. Um, and she's like so excited to have that experience that only you can get at a store. But when that was taken away, you know, people, people were only able to buy online. And so right. it created kind of this moment where I think it's going to shift more in the reverse to like a 60, 40. That's my gut for at least the foreseeable future, because now we know how it works like Instacart and, you know, Uber eats, which we were kind of talking about before, like people now yeah. get the whole, I can buy digital and then it physically gets to me and we're more comfortable with it. And then from a hair care standpoint, I'm sure, I guess I just love to get you guys thoughts because uh, I don't, obviously I'm not in the makeup game, but <laughs> our, when it comes to Sephora, do you think most consumers like the whole try out, obviously work with a different makeup artist in store, maybe try different things out. Um, and, but hair care is different, right? It would be where you don't obviously get a chance to, to try it out. So you could just buy it online, but we'd love to see how you guys have seen the industry evolve uh, with that consumer behavior. Yeah, I mean, hair care is a bit different to skincare and color. Yeah. You can do a lot more trial in store with those categories. Mm -hmm. But thing that's really integral to our brand is scent. Um, we're like really known for our fragrances. And so, um, you know, in store, you can do testers of dry shampoo and texturizing spray, and you can test our body cream and, you know, some of those things in store. And so we do miss out on that piece. And I also just think that like, um, you know, just the touch and feel of, of how premium the product is and the packaging yeah. is, you know, is definitely impactful. And when you get to see the whole line, I mean, it's just a quick snippet of who we are on a store fixture, but when you get to see the whole offering there, um, it's just a different experience than a digital merchandising um, situation. So um, I do think, you know, trial, I, I agree with Aaron on where the mix of business is going. Um, I think 60, 40 sounds right, but I don't think store shopping will ever diminish much past right. that point because there is that experience yeah. that you, you just can't replicate. Yeah. Um, how do you think, how have you guys done in terms of subscriptions? Cause I, you know, you notice on Amazon, you can just have it every 15th of the month. You can have your shampoo get, uh, sent to you. Um, is that a huge part of your guys's market and industry? And do you, I would assume you are going to see that continue. Um, not even like people ordering on their phone every month, but literally subscribing and, you know, set it and forget it. Yeah, I'll we've discussed, um, we sorry, we've discussed subscription <laughs> and we've actually started discussing subscribe and save as well as strategies. Mm -hmm. We haven't executed just yet because of the weird state of affairs right now. Um, I don't know about Hannah, but I'm not washing my hair as much. And like <laughs> your routines are not quite what they normally would be. And so it's uh, a weird time to say, hey, you need this every two months because we don't know what's going to be in two yeah. months. But I definitely think from a business perspective, a loyalty perspective, um, if we can give back in some sort of way where they're getting either uh, a value for it or um, there's a program to it that we enhance the consumer's experience, which is a filter we all try to look through it way. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a definite place for it within the business model um, over the, in the next 12 months. This is also um, a pro tip. You guys can have this for free. I don't expect any consulting money or anything like that. <laughs> As uh, someone with no hair, you still got to shampoo and condition your scalp, man. It's important. You know, if not, it's dry and itchy. And people think once you shave your head, you just have to shave it and go. But it's, uh, it's a lesson I learned early on, just to let you guys know. Uh, <laughs> you should use our scalp and body scrub. Oh, uh, yeah. Love, you know, maybe you can send me a free sample. I'd love to try it. Um, I know someone. All right, so, I know someone who can do that. <laughs> let's do it. So you mentioned earlier, uh, Aaron, is obviously what happened in June and then just the social justice movement, which is, you know, I mean, we've talked a lot about what's happening in our country and our world right now. You're talking about 50 states, 18 countries, one of the largest civil rights movements in the history of our planet all happens to be right in the middle of all this COVID stuff for businesses as well. And it affected, I think, the beauty market more than anybody, that, that movement, because there was the pull up or shut up. And there was a lot of social um, campaigns that were going against brands and saying, listen, you need to show us what your employee uh, makeup looks like, what your leadership looks like. And we just love to hear from, I guess I'll start with Hannah, um, you know, when that moment happens from a social justice standpoint, how did your guys' brand step up? But also when, you know, the consumers and the kind of hashtag started going, um, you know, from a brand standpoint, how'd you guys tackle that? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, it was such an interesting moment in time, you know, obviously as a human being and a citizen of this country, but as a brand marketer, um, because 
I've never experienced anything culturally before where I've, I've seen every brand literally feel as if they have to respond yeah. to it, um, mm -hmm. which I think is awesome. But then obviously, you know, you get, you do get performative posts and you do get, you know, the armchair activists who, you know, want, want to say something to say something, but we, you know, really wanted to move the needle forward in any way that we could um, beyond just a post and a conversation um, and an alliance, you know, with that movement. And so we really took the time to go back and reflect and think about, you know, as a brand, like, what do we have at our disposal? We have influence. We have over a million people that interact with us on Instagram every day. We have access um, to yeah. our founder who is connected to a lot of really powerful creators and activists and talent on her end. Um, and then we also have, you know, resources internally, you know, we have the budget to go work with a really great DEI partner. And, you know, we have a little bit of flexibility right now. We have open roles on our team right now. So we have, you know, a, a unique position to be hiring in this crazy year and to be able to relook at a more diversified candidate slate and really prioritize that and, and you know, reassess how we look at hiring. But on the social media and community side, we um, have committed to covering one topic or theme per month to continue awesome. the conversation, um, you know, in depth and at length. And so um, in August, we've been talking about environmental racism um, and intersectional environmentalism. And what we really wanted to do, because none of us are experts, frankly, at, at, at any of these topics that we've selected for the year. Um, we want to hand over our platform to people in the space that can really speak knowledgeably on it, especially, you know, Black and um, other, you know, women of color um, who can take over and really, really shed some serious light on these issues. And so, you know, we're going to touch on voting and we're going to talk about gender and wage gaps and all of those things like through the lens of a, a black person living in this country. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're really committed to that. And then we've also committed, um, you know, a substantial donation of over a hundred thousand dollars now um, to different organizations that we're aligning with in partnership with these themes and topics of conversation. And so um, that's what we're doing outwardly. And then we're, you know, we're doing a lot internally as well um, to make sure that not only are we prioritizing a diversified candidate slate, but that we're creating an inclusive environment and culture for everybody that works for our company. Um, and, you know, we're just like, we're very lucky, I think, to work at this brand because yeah. we've always um, been pretty um, forward about taking a stance on things that could have seemed, you know, political or divisive. Right. Um, you know, we spoke out, um, you know, in support of Planned Parenthood a couple years ago when, um, they were starting to talk about defunding it and you know it had a massive response from our community and we've just always wanted to you know we have so many vocal amazing members in our community that are like friends to us and if something matters to them it matters to us and so we've always wanted to speak up on the things that we know affect our community um and this is just like too big um for our country and for us as individuals and for us as a team um to you know to just post about for one month and abandon and so yeah. Um, that's the plan for the rest of this year, but um, it's certainly going to be a large conversation for 2021 and beyond as well. It's a it's a serious commitment for us. Yeah, and Aaron, I know when we talked a few weeks ago, you were kind of smiling ear to ear just how proud you were of, of the company, yeah. obviously being new and being hit with this pretty early on in your uh, in your career at Way, um, that you felt like the you guys did the right thing and, and continued to kind of grow and evolve there. Yeah, I think one of the things, and I have to just give hats off to Hannah because yeah. everything she said was amazing, but she kind of underplayed the amount of work that her and her team went through in a very short amount of time to deal with this. And, you know, so Hannah, you said that this is kind of like this first cultural moment where you felt brands needed to respond. And the first thing I thought of was the last time I ever sensed that or experienced that was 9-11. Yeah. But it wasn't a moment where brands could be part of the change. You could make a statement to be united and to want to, you know, bring people through that terrible moment in time. But Here, how does a brand stop terrorism, you know? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Here we have an ability to make change. Mm -hmm. And Hannah and our CEO, Colin, and the whole company said, we need to do that. And it wasn't performative. And to, you know, Hannah's point, 
every week um, we get an email about things we can do for ourselves and things to either read or to consider or new resources um, that someone on my team runs. Her name's Matali and she's amazing. And, you know, then we have what Hannah and the team are doing externally to do that. And then we have what we're doing in HR and it's, it's genuine and authentic and it comes from a, a really powerful place. And if you take that plus how, we managed the COVID situation with people and giving everyone a two day timeout and, you know, giving everyone money to kind of get themselves a home office or supplies that they need. And thinking through it from the human perspective I th- is really special. And I'm very grateful that I got to be a part, I'm a part of it, you know, cause it is uh, that's, magical. No, I, I love what you said there, like the 9-11, you're absolutely right, but you couldn't really make change or take action. In this situation you can. I'm just speaking as three professionals talking right now in the industry, Hannah, like, how do you find that balance? I know there's not a perfect recipe here, but you guys are a brand, you you provide hair care products, you're, you're turning into like this lifestyle brand as well, but trying to find that healthy balance, right? Of like making change, education, um, you know, propping people up and telling these stories, but at the same time, you know, your, your consumers are coming to you for a product, right? So how have you guys figured that out? Do you just kind of have to like A-B test and kind of see what that perfect balance is of making change, but also focusing on product? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're lucky because we don't have an executive team or a board that is like, you know, holding us to super crazy metrics. Um, yeah. On my, Aaron might <laughs> for the <laughs> I feel. But in terms of like engagement and social growth and things that we look like, look at as KPIs on my team. Some of, you know, some of the things that are an aberration from hair care and beauty content, they don't get as much engagement. Um, Also, it's a new type of um, content pillar for us. So you kind of need to like build that rapport and that understanding of what we're delivering there before people start to engage with you. But, um, you know, we just have to sort of abandon the metrics and not think about them and realize that like, we're doing this, um, you know, to get as much awareness of these issues out there as possible. And I think it's just like, I mean, you got to read the room, um, like in life and as a brand, like and there's it changes daily, yeah. weekly. I mean, yeah, exactly. Right now, right. like there, yeah. there's been a lot of days this year that telling someone how to do a high pony was not what anyone needed to hear about. Um, and if, if people are choosing to, you know, follow you on Instagram or, you know, fan you on Facebook or interact with you on Twitter or subscribe to your emails, like, you know, we're coming into their, their devices in their home on a personal level. And so um, if we inundate them with crap, um, then, you know, they're not going to want to enge- continue to engage with us. And so um, I think that having genuine, relevant conversations about what's going on in the world from our lens and our perspective and, and what makes way us, like, with, you know, we're very funny, relatable, conversational. We don't take, you know, many things too seriously. You know, we we're able to deliver, you know, like, good dialogue on, on both beauty and other topics. And so I think as long as we continue to be us and continue to read the room, um, then, you know, we'll just continue to tweak the balance as we go. And that's the beauty of social content too, is like, we literally change yeah. the plan on a dime. So, well, and I think what was interesting that Hannah's team did, and I saw the impact on sales was with COVID, there was this shift too. Yeah, I remember the meeting and we were like, do people really want to talk about product right now? Or maybe they want to see cute puppies. And like they did a survey and they wanted to see cute puppies. And so we did a ton of amazing content and people were like, escapism content. I couldn't get enough of it. And they were like, this is what I wanted. And they, instead of trying to sell them a product in that moment, we tried to, you know, put the human component first again. And we saw traffic come up from that. We saw people care more because of that. And that's not the only reason we do it, but it's not like it negatively impacted that. It was the same thing with Black Lives Matter and with our email content and how we were doing our performance marketing. When we were being sensitive to the situations at hand, reading the room, as Hannah said, we actually have seen it kind of pay off, um, understanding that we're putting the human component first. And our CEO has said this, it's one of the reasons, um, you know, that I wanted to work with him is he'll always choose the people. He'll always choose people first and not, you know, the numbers, not anything. He he knows that people run a company and people uh, live in this country in the world that we're in. And he'll always keep that human component, which I think allows Hannah and myself to have a little bit more grace than KPI, KPI, KPI. Right. That's awesome. And I think I really want to dig into this because I, I, as a marketer, I see so many companies getting this wrong. And I think you guys have done an amazing job and a lot of people can learn from you. If you haven't checked that way and what they're doing on social, please check it out. 
But again, you're a product brand, right? And there's so many products from energy drinks to CPG to um, candy to what have you, especially on social. If you go to their social feeds 90% of the time, it's just the product in sand, the product on a bar, just um, it, it really is ad type content of just the product. And you guys have done a really good job of building a community around that product, which that's why the COVID materials and the Black Lives Matter and the cute puppies make sense because you're kind of building this community of like who, I'm assuming, right? Who is our consumer? Who are we trying to go after? And what does our consumer enjoy outside of just our whey products? They enjoy cute puppies. They enjoy being educated, things like that. So we'd love to hear from you guys. And Hannah, I'm sure it started with you and four years ago, like let's not always worry about how much you know, checkouts of this Instagram post get us, let's build a community and it's gonna work itself out long-term. Yeah, I mean, again, it goes back to kind of that friendship that I was talking about with our customers. Like, it's about building something that they actually enjoy, the interactions that they actually enjoy. And then if you're able to interest them in some product while they're there, you know, that's that's not really the goal of our Instagram. The Instagram is yeah. for them to get to know us and to learn more about us. And if that results in them purchasing from us, amazing um but like one of our best performing pieces of content ever was i think it i think it's jimmy kimmel that does like mean tweets where yeah, he re- yeah. people do the mean tweets yeah like we had a product i won't name it um but it <laughs> had some um performance issues they were um exploding on people and like creating like a foam explosion in people's houses um and so rather than like tiptoeing around like a massive quality issue that we had um, we did a YouTube episode of um, like mean tweets and mean reviews, and we just had people in the company read the reviews and tweets. That just people just own it, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. just own it, and like it. That piece of content performed like incredibly for us, and it's just like you know, at the end of the day, we're just a group of human beings doing our best <laughs> behind the yeah. brand. Um, and I think people respond to that like behind the curtain realness that like you know company no one likes a corporate company anymore. It's true. I always say that social media is like dating. And if you go on a first date and the person only talks about themselves in this, like, here's my product, here's my product, here's my product, here's my product. Are you, you're not going to go on a second date with them. So like, it's this ability to have a one-to-one and like ongoing dialogue and in kind of respect what your community wants. And that I think builds something way more powerful, which is what Hannah and the team have done. That's awesome. Um, I want to get a little more granular in terms of your guys' strategy. How have you guys increased your distribution through partnerships, through influencers? Have you, in the beauty space, I know overall influencers um, are a big part of a lot of marketing plans, but what have you guys seen success in? What has kind of moved the needle for you outside of just your own and operated channels? What campaigns or different distribution levers have you seen really work well uh, for your products? Yeah, well, we're a very lucky brand in many aspects, but two in particular, um, since you asked about influencers and distribution, um, you know, we were obviously very lucky to get into Sephora right away when we launched. Mm -hmm. Um, They're an incredible partner and being a part of Sephora and having them behind your brand and, you know, sort of incubating you and supporting you when you're an indie brand that just launched um, is absolutely instrumental. I can't even tell you how much value comes from them as a partner. Um, as well as all of our other retail partners are all great as well, but they were our first and our biggest and, um, you know, Sephora machines, very powerful. They Um, essentially put steroids on any of your marketing efforts. It seems like. Exactly. They, you know, they do a great job of, you know, incubating influencer led brands and, um, you know, brands that have really cool innovation in formula and ingredient stuff. You know, they do a great job of, um, marketing sort of like what's hot in, cross-brand trends and stuff in store. So we were very lucky to launch with them and that was a great catalyst for us. Um, And then on the influencer side, you know, our founder, Jen Atkin, is an influencer herself. Um, And um, while she she doesn't really serve as the face of our brand, that was never her intention. She didn't put her name on anything. You know, she really likes to be behind the scenes with the creative and the product, you know, stuff with the team. But um, you know, she obviously comes with a lot of connections. She has a lot of friends with th- that have brands and they, you know, support each other and they give her good advice and they're happy to help support way when we launch stuff. But that was kind of like the initial fuel for the fire was like, you know, some friends of Jen, but then like people started seeing the brand on social. And then we picked up like kind of like a tumbleweed, this really amazing organic community of 
influencers of all sizes. Um, and, and we're so lucky to have that now because that is a key component of our success always. Um, we have about, at this point, like 2,500 active influencers um, that we work with. And um, we don't sponsor posts with any of them. Um, we do compensate them for their time if they come to work with us on content or shoots or anything. Um, and if we were to ever use their imagery in an ad or something, obviously they would be compensated, but we don't pay people to post or say anything about us and our brand. So any opinions about way out there are completely their own. Um, and that's just like that ecosystem is really just like fueled itself. Um, you know, the buzziness of who's talking about it and who's getting it and stuff. And so, um, that's, you know, something that I will never shut up about, especially when we're in board and, and leadership conversations of how important that community is. Um, and it's really like, you know, we have some really big celebrities that talk about our brand, um, some of Jen's clients and most brands, you know, could never even afford to have those people do a post about them, but it's actually the micro influencers that really right. drop the growth and awareness for us. And is that where the credibility of like building that 2,500 ecosystem, did that come? Cause those of you who don't know, like Jen did, you know, did and does hair for Kim Kardashian, Kendall Jenner, Haley Bieber. Um, was that the immediate credibility where these people started to just like, I'm going to try this brand out because my favorite celebrity uses this brand and they just became like, you know, brand ambassadors from the, from the get. Yeah. I mean, I think it certainly sparks some interest when members of that family talk. About <laughs> yeah. But I also think that just a little bit. Yeah. But I also think in this day and age, like, uh, you know, people are very cautious about what mega celebrities and mega influencers For promote sure. because a lot of them are paid incredible amounts of money to talk about anything that you see on their mm -hmm. channel. And sometimes they're not forthcoming about what is either they're an investor in it or it was gifted to them through another celebrity friend or whatever. And so it definitely helped to get the initial buzz and awareness out for the brand, but the growth of the brand and the success of our launches always comes from the loyal micro influencers in our community that we've worked with since early days in their career. And they've worked with us since early days in our brand. And we've, formed a really good relationship. And those are the most meaningful thing that we have. And for that ecosystem, um, the 2,500 is, do you guys, for new products and things like that, you kind of seed it out to them first and let them try it out. And then you're organically, they're just excited about it and post it. There's not really like, like you said, even money exchanging hands most times, nor is there like, you need to do X, Y, and Z if we give you this product. Correct. Um, we gift it That's to awesome. them. Um, I'll put a feather in my own cap here and say that we've got some really creative mailings that we've done um, in the past for our product launches. Um, we we really go for it on the fun in those boxes. And as a result- You gotta share the detox one that happened in the middle of COVID because it was so this- Oh yeah. Beautiful oops. oops, it was this beautiful That's oops, it was great. Really, yeah, it was a beautiful oops as Aaron likes to say. But when we launched our, we had a detox shampoo that we launched earlier this year. It launched like, peak COVID in April. Um, and we had planned that, to mail Can you back up one second? What's a detox shampoo? What was this? <laughs> I'm confused. You might, you, <laughs> uh, a detox shampoo is basically like, it's a clarifying shampoo that you would use once a week, maybe more if you're greasy, um, as, like a, as like a treatment. Um, it has apple cider vinegar in it and it like really strips oil, dirt, impurities, hard water from your hair um, and then you use it with any other conditioner or treatment. Okay. Like yeah. And so yeah. we had been planning this influencer mailer for a long time, obviously not expecting a global pandemic. Um, and it was a digital detox box. Um, and so um, it was for the detox shampoo, but the message was just about like detoxing from all of the BS of being on your screen all the time. Um, and so we had like, we gave them, I don't know if you remember that game mash that people used to play like on a piece yeah. of paper. Um, yeah, yeah. We, we sent them some mash games. Um, we sent them a little bag that said, put away your phone so that they could, you know, ha have non-screen time. We sent them um, postcards that they could hand write letters to friends and family. That's awesome. and so, um, and disposable camera, so you could still take pictures. Camera. I loved that. Uh, disposable camera. Um, and so, awesome. yeah, that just worked out like in terms of everyone being at home and like exhausted of Zoom and uh, working out on Instagram Live and all of those things. Um, it ended up being really timely, but we always have a theme 
um, to our box around the product um, that typically, you know, we have cute merchandise or, you know, sometimes we do other brand collabs in there or whatever it may be. Um, and people hopefully get excited and, and post about it. It's funny you say that because I kind of geek out. All my employees will probably roll their eyes, but I always geek out over the psychology of people. And I'll write my clients sometimes a handwritten note. And you'd be amazed of like, I get three different thank yous. Like nobody's you know written me a handwritten note in years. And um, it, it feels like you guys have really figured out like, yo, humans like to get gifts in the mail. And if you can make it fun, they're going to like really enjoy that and appreciate it. And there's going to be like that tie to your brand. Um, that's just really smart. I think again, it's, it's what a lot of brands don't do is like taking that time and effort of like thinking up the kit and like, what if we did this and let's, you know, let's order a thousand disposable cameras and all those different things that go into it. Cause it takes time and effort and a lot of thought behind it. But the payoff, it seems like what you guys have seen and, and Aaron, I'll get your thoughts on this. The payoff is you get those brand loyalists that are pretty much got your back for life. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just think what another part of the community that is really unique too, is we've got those 2,500, but Hannah and the team, um, Amanda and Leah, they also leverage that community. And we also leverage our database, our CRM database to do product research too. So there's a lot of these people who may not be mm. quote unquote influencers that still get to be a part of our brand experience in advance. And we really value their opinion, which is a different version of loyalty. It's a different version of a relationship with a brand. So that's another really kind of fun component that I like. And they have the historics too, like, hey, like it's kind of similar to this product that I tried, you know, three months ago, but it's not as good as this product. Kind of give you like, they can actually give you legitimate um, advice or feedback on that. That's awesome. Um, I would love to get your guys' thoughts just on the, on I guess the macro, right? Like the beauty industry as a whole. Um, I read this crazy stat, I'm sure you guys are aware of it, but global beauty and personal care products expected to grow from four, almost 500 billion in 2018 to close to 800 billion by 2026. So I think you guys are in the right, the right industry, um, globally Wait. anyway. So um, what do you, I, like, what, do, what do you guys see in terms of trends, like how people are taking skincare and hair care and all these different things more seriously? You know, and, and I guess I'll start with Hannah, but where do you guys kind of see things going and what are you excited about, about the future of this, of this category? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, hair care, especially with it, as a subset within the beauty industry is really on fire um, with growth right now. And I think it's because it's a little bit, um, we use the term skinification of hair a lot, um, which kind of, I hate that word, but. <laughs> relevant. Um, but basically people are realizing that, you know, you have to invest in your hair the way that you would your skin. Um, there's even similar ingredients among the categories that are beneficial and people are just edu like, you know, with social media and all the content and, you know, ta influencers and things that are out there that people are watching, people are learning a lot more about ingredients and, and how to care for their hair and skin. Um, and people are understanding that like a lot of your hair health comes from your scalp. A lot of your hair health comes from internal, you know, supplements, what are you eating? You know, what's your routine? Um, and so people are really wanting to invest in hair as part of overall wellness. Um, and so I think we'll continue to see a lot of growth in like the treatment category um, for scalp and hair health. I think ingestibles within beauty will continue yeah. to grow. Um, and, you know, for us as a brand, we are evolving into more of a lifestyle positioning beyond hair. Um, which felt really natural to us just because like we are very well known for the fragrances that we have in our hair care products. It was like when we were developing the brand, like Jen really wanted hair products that smelled like expensive perfume because she didn't feel like there were any out there that weren't like too bubblegummy or vanilla. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, you know, worked with an extremely um, famous fragrance house to develop our fragrances. And then when people started trying our hair products, they became obsessed with the scents and then asked us to create perfumes. So Same. now we have Eau de Parfums and some of those scents. And then we moved into the body category, which was again at the demands of our community. Um, so we've got like body um, scrub, cream, cleanser, we have bath bombs. So we're in that space now. And um, you know, we just got off a call before this, I'm um, talking about 2021 and we have some other spaces that we're playing in next year. But um, I think like for us, that was the evolution that felt more natural than like 
tools or other places that we could have gone. Um, just because our, you know, once you start to establish you know, a lot of credibility with your customer on efficacy, scent, packaging, all of those things, then they're curious, like, what could you make me for my face? What could you make me for my kitchen? What could you like people yeah. ask, like we get requests all the time, you know? Um, and so we're always, we're always listening. And so um, I think the hair care industry is just going to continue to boom. Hmm. Uh, but we, and we'll always be rooted in our expertise there, but we're moving into a lifestyle space. Yeah. I think the industry as a whole, just like in fashion and anything else has a cycle. There's these cyclical components, mm -hmm. right? So never in my life did I think eighties fashion and neon and biker shorts were going to come back in fashion yeah. and they did. And they came in really big. And I mean, everyone was wearing biker shorts just like right at the beginning of COVID. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I have PTSD. Like that's a thing again right now. Uh, see, <laughs> that's the best. That is the best zoom outfit, right? It's like the, it's yeah. like the mullet, like business on top party on the bottom. Um, but you know, we went through this big boom with color, right? Color cosmetics was huge. And you had like the urban decays and the two face and the benefits. And it was about like creation on your face and YouTube really blew up from that because you had all the people doing tutorials and you know, some of the stuff these people could do blows my mind. Then you saw it shift over to the, like to what Hannah's talking about, which is this wellness component that has started to really take over many categories, including food, um, to even to fashion. That then people are like, well, wait, what about what's under that makeup and what is it doing to my skin and is it dangerous and is it safe? And then you created this need to actually take care of the layer underneath the makeup. So you saw this shift into like skincare. Skincare has boomed from that for the recently, but now it's moving over into hair care, which has traditionally been a smaller piece of the pie, but it's growing because it's another component of how do I make sure there's a lot of concerns about thinning hair, um, losing your hair. Uh, we just launched in China and it's one of the number one issues in that country right now um, that I wasn't aware of, but it's happening there too. And there's a lot of conversation about it. So people want to take that into consideration in their wellness routine. And then how does that wellness then take the cycle back over to color cosmetics, which will eventually happen again. Like these are right. kind of like cyclical pieces that usually occur. Uh, and then from just like that global number that you mentioned, you know, there's huge growth in China right now for the beauty industry that I think mm -hmm. we're just kind of starting to scrape the surface of because of the animal testing components over there. Most of us won't go. We'll only do cross border, which allows you to land in Hong Kong and not have mm -hmm. to do any animal testing because most of the American brands are very cruelty free based, including ourselves. Um, but once that shifts in that country in the next few years, which has been on discussions for many years, it could create a whole other boom for the industry again. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's funny you say that about health and wellness overall, and that's a, I guess the macro category over beauty sometimes, but you know, I even asked my parents, like, can you envision a world where when you were in high school, you would pay a hundred bucks to go work out, which is what tough mutter is and all these, you know what I'm saying? Like all these different things, Yeah. but people are so invested in their health. Now they'll pay a hundred dollars to go work out or a color run to go run three miles and get blasted with, you know, <laughs> color or whatever it is. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting how how um, those dynamics change consumer behavior. When it comes to, I guess, the social networks you guys are on, I would love to get your thoughts on uh, the different, you know, it changes, you know, I, I, and obviously I'm in this game, but Instagram Reels is now a thing and TikTok is huge. And for you guys, like, when do you choose to move into different, um, not only social networks like a TikTok, but when new, uh, when new things come out for these different social networks like Instagram and Reels, like, do you guys look at that and how do you choose to make that priority? Yeah, I mean, I think we will go anywhere once we believe we have something to add <laughs> of value, but we're, um, you know, we're in a unique position with Jen as an influencer. She gets to beta test a lot of these features before they're announced and, and rolled nice. out to the public. Um, and we're actually a beta partner with Instagram as a brand on a lot of things behind the scenes as well. So um, we do get a little early testing and feedback with them. Um, but, you know, Jen has had reels and been working with reels for a while now. So we've kind of got to see like, what can we put out there and what, what would it look like and how would nice. we respond? And so um, we're fortunate to have that insider info um, because we can be early adapters on things. Um, but again, going back to challenges of, of COVID in this year, like we were going to launch on TikTok. Um, but it's something we pulled back on just because of limited content capability. Yeah. Um, but I think that there's a case for almost like reels and TikTok. I think they're, they're a little similar. Um, obviously, a little bit, 
Uh, Insert- they're identical. Yeah. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. Just, just like stories is identical to Snapchat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I get a piece of that pie. Like, let's be honest. But, um, I think, like, obviously, Instagram is a great place to interact with people daily and and have a more, like, editorial presence, whereas, like, on YouTube, we can do longer form storytelling and, and, like, really build, like, brand equity and really get, like, behind the scenes and into product development and company stuff, and there's just a lot more um, storytelling capability on YouTube, and Twitter is great for customer service. Um, TikTok, I think, will be awesome for tutorials. Um, I know yeah. I'm too, I'm too old. I don't know how to make a TikTok, but I know how to look at TikTok and um, <laughs> like it's uh, addicting. Be careful. The content on there is incredible. Um, you know the things that you people put together um, and the quick, snappy ways that people are editing. You know visual tutorials of everything from cooking to beauty um, is so interesting. So we'll definitely be in that space and playing with reels. But I don't know. We're willing to try anything. I'd so say. Hannah, you're not on the uh, latest viral dances on TikTok, the Taylor Swift song, nothing like that. You're no, I um, you're sitting I, on the sidelines right now. I asked my fiance if during quarantine if we could try and learn a TikTok dance, and he said we would have to cancel our wedding. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hilarious. Um, I can't blame him. Um, and then Aaron, like, I wanted to ask you guys about Instagram shopping, and I know that came out um, within the last year or so, but. Have you guys seen success there? Is that something you guys, um, you know, market towards? And I guess have seen any uh, good good stats or positivity from that with that feature? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great positivity to be a part of any beta for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Like, there's algorithm benefits. Usually, there's um, more access to different other elements within Instagram. I would say it's not the largest driver of revenue for us, right. but I think it's a key component to continually pushing digital forward. Um, we can't, to the points that Hannah made and that we talked about earlier, we can't look at everything of, did it make us a million dollars? Because if it didn't, it's not right. worth it. Because those are consumer adoptions that also have to change. Um, we're part of another beta with another technology that involves social that I know for the foreseeable next six months is not going to be a revenue driver, but there's an algorithm benefit to it. And there's a chance that if it becomes big for that platform that we'll have been first on it, which you just kind of get to ride a wave of. And you need to keep pushing that until the consumer behaviors change. Uh, I think the bigger component for me with social is finding a way to diversify our advertising because Facebook owns so much of it as a company. Mm-hmm. Between Instagram and Facebook itself, it's kind of the AOL of today now, whereas like everyone right. had AOL ads. They own so much of the internet. Now Wait, we have- did you have an AIM growing up like I did? Oh, yes, I did. Okay, good. Oh, should I, did I just age myself? What was your username? <laughs> My <laughs> username was Hanners4646. Right, Mine was okay. Knox, N-O-X, Knox Gumby1. Cause it, That's not the, do you guys remember the Noxzema girl with the curly hair? So that oh, people right. called me Knox. There yeah. you go. Okay. And you can tell I've lost a lot of my hair because uh, there was a lot <laughs> more of it. Um, so the AOL was that. And now we've got in- Facebook is kind of this conglomerate of all the ads. And so you're kind of sitting in this one pool. And I think yeah. P- Pinterest, um, if what TikTok does, what happens with Snapchat, who's kind of like this, what's going on over there space, like all of these components or other content places to diversify your portfolio of advertising so you're not sitting in one network, I think is a key component of pushing forward too. That's always like the the key thing, right? Like it's so important to invest in these social platforms, but it's also hurts your soul that you own none of the followers that you, you know, you, you gain. Um, that being said, from your guys' standpoint, obviously the only thing you really can own from your customer is emails. Um, so from that standpoint, how, how, how big of that is that part of your strategy when it comes to newsletters and just making sure that if, you know, I don't know, the president bans the social network, which seems to be a possibility right. now that you don't lose all that, that blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. I think that, um, one of the key initiatives that I have for this year is to actually get up on SMS because of the same mm-hmm. thing. I have for many, many years been trying to get an SMS program up and running, um, at brands because we're on our phone way more than we are on email. And I think there's massive email fatigue. And I think it's even worse in a COVID world where that's all, that's how we're communicating. And text is almost more personal now if you handle it correctly. So I would say email is important. And so is the person's phone number. And I think that's an even higher likelihood of a lead if they're willing to give you their phone number. Like that's like amazing. So um, it is a key part of the strategy. We just launched a program to help incentivize giving us the email so that we can also then test 
who kind of comes in, that that incentive actually stays what their lifetime value is. And then CRM in general is kind of a key strategy of how we take that yeah. database, understand it, make the most of it, and then start to value it in different ways to the points that we said earlier, whether that's early access to products, how do we create loyalty, how do we make them feel a part of a community like you do in social, but through the CRM program too. That's awesome. I think that's the one thing people miss is like, you need to you need to provide value. And like you said, like, why am I giving you my information? Like, well, right. Like you said, early access, discounts, you know, whatever those things may be. Um, now, I'll, now I'll say, okay, you can have all my information. I mean, Aaron, it seems like you've kind of done your research on the SMS side of it. So I'd love to get your thoughts, um, not only with Way, but brands in general. From a consumer standpoint, where do you think that, that mixture is right now? Because I think too much of it, of it can be way overboard and people will be like, you're bugging me and you're invading my personal space. But the right mixture of it could be actually welcomed. Yeah, I think it goes back to that concept of value. And so mm -hmm. when social media first came out, there was this concept of, did you entertain them? Did you educate them? Did you like, you have to give them something yeah. to make them want to share it or engage mm -hmm. with it. Otherwise it's pacify. Same thing with the text message. If we get to the point where they do that, let's say we do it via a discount. Let's say we do it via a loyalty program, but then we have them and we have to respect what they, you know, just gave us, which is their phone number. So to me, there's a component of it, not just being about, discount or we just launched a product, but taking kind of what Hannah and the, uh, the content team was doing and finding a compelling way to do it in, in phone, in, in text, whether that's tutorials. So we know that you just bought our new super dry shampoo. And so we text you, here's a tutorial awesome. on how best yeah. to use it instead of just, yeah. hey, buy some stuff. Like, so it's those components that we have to create some compelling stories around um, that we'll be hopefully investing in in the next year. Um, I know I've talked a lot about community and making sure you're not just like, um, always selling to your customer because it comes off across obviously not a great relationship or, or two-way conversation there. Um, I always think I always use Nike as a perfect example. They just do a really good job, I think, of selling that dream and kind of building that community without saying, now go to your local, you know, uh, Dick Sporting Goods and buy this shoe for $129. They often don't even have any type of call to action on any of their main advertisements or, or commercials. Um, so Hannah, I'll, t I'll, ha I'll ask you to put your consultant hat on. It doesn't have to be, you know, on behalf of Way, but from a beauty standpoint, like where do you, where do you think, um, you know, brands make mistakes or what do you see in the industry where um, they're maybe not, not doing the right thing with their consumers? Um, you know, one thing I see a lot is um, content that's just really overproduced. I, I think that in an, you know, something that's shot natively in social for social uh, usually performs the best. And I think obviously, you know, a lot of brands are very precious about their aesthetics um, and their brand DNA. And so, you know, there's, you know, they want their images certain quality or they want the color palette a certain way. And like and every video looks like a TV commercial. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, and I just think that people are more interested in seeing things that are more real and more raw these days. Um, and I think there's a time in the place for both. I do see a lot of brands on, on Instagram, you know, being a little overproduced. Um, and I also like, I think, um, you know, it goes back to what Aaron said about dating, which like, I, I agree. I don't want to go on a date with someone who talks about themselves all the time. <laughs> and I'm funny. Um, I, I think that a lot of brands, um, you know, there's, there's limited real estate on social. Like, you know, we only post once a day on the grid and um, share our stories on Instagram stories. And then only a certain percent of your total audience will even see that. Um, and so I think that people worry about all the things, you know, as a brand, there are always a million things that you need to promote or talk about relevant to your brand. And so I think being afraid to give up some of that real estate to non-saleable content um, or non-product driven content. And then I think something for us that we've gotten more and more comfortable doing is like even related to some of like the anti-racism work that we're doing and stuff is like, just because we're a hair brand doesn't mean we only have to talk about hair. Um, you know, it's nice if they're, you know, I, I think we still need to feel like us and sound like us and people still want to expect the same, you know, type of voice and, you know, content that they would get from us, but you don't have to, you know, quote unquote, stay in your lane. Um, you know, you can really, you know, you, you can talk about puppies and you can talk about environmental racism. Um, you know, you, you can ask people things instead of telling them things. Um, I think that's another big component um, is don't just use your content to talk at people. Um, you have mm -hmm. people that are there at your fingertips um, in a way that, you know, brands 10 years ago did not have. Um, so you've got literally like a built-in 
feedback base always. Um, and so um, I think, you know, making sure that you're creating the dialogue and not just talking at everybody all the time, but I don't know. I think you just got to have fun with it. So yeah. And I want to get your thoughts, Aaron, but I think what most brands get wrong is rather than looking at the customer as just dollar signs, it's like, yep. you know, I don't know what your guys' perfect demo is. For, well, let's say the product is you're going after females 18 to 35. And then the second level is like, what are those 18 to 35 year old females like health and wellness? Or they, like you said, they like puppies or whatever those things are and start to build your content around that. Um, and, and, and it, it helps from the top down too, to not say, I'm not going to invest in social unless it gets me it gets me money type thing. So Aaron, I'm sure you have something to add on that. Yeah, I think um, I worked in entertainment for a period of time. And what we would do is we would look at the show and what were all the tangential components of it that were relevant mm -hmm. that we could talk about in social. So I think to Hannah's point, and it's not just your audience, it's your brand, right? So we are animal lovers at this company. Like it's like, right. we had like a bring your dog to Zoom moment, you know, and like we had national puppy day off. like. We puppies make sense for us because it's also a core component of the brand. Um, so What's I the think the brand is the people that work for the brand. You know what I mean? That's a big part of it too. Yeah, and Jen and the yeah. personalities and like what we care about. And so building out a personality because no one likes a you know to the same thing about dating. If you only have yeah. one dimension to your whole personality, yeah. like whoa, that's yeah. no fun. And the same you know, so we have to have multiple dimensions. And same thing with content strategy for like emails and things like that. Like how do we make sure that we're not only talking about the obvious stuff, like here's our product and how do we start building out better content strategies for our blog and things like that, that are beneficial and add value. Um, from what I, from an e-commerce perspective and a marketing perspective, what I think some beauty brands maybe don't always do well is investing in customer relations at like the highest of levels. Um, I think another one is focusing on the KPI. So, a lot of best practices in other industries, to your point, like CPGs or really transactional brands, there's all these little like tricks, right? Like put a timer on the top of your website. And it's like, my heart sinks when I hear that. Cause I'm like, that's just stressing your customer out and kind of like yeah. bam you're bamboozling them. And yes, your conversion rate might go up, but you might've pissed off 15 people. So mm -hmm. um, thinking about it from that, again, the human way and like you can innovate, but make sure that you're considering that that component to it and not just doing it for the conversion because you might get that conversion and never get that person back because of their experience. So not always just looking at the, like the typical best practices of how to like convert a customer, but maybe innovating on those and keeping the human component at the center. Yeah. What's funny about what you guys just said is like, it's so it applies across every single brand really. I mean, when you think about whether it's Way, the Dallas Cowboys, Monster Energy, Fiji Water, like that. That's one thing that, I mean, we all are speaking the same language, but, um, you know, just providing value and being genuine to each platform and, you know, being social on social and all those different things you guys has said, it really can fall under um, marketing and, and social for any brand, which is awesome. Um, I would love to maybe kind of wrap it up here a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Aaron. Um, what's like the biggest thing through 2020? I'm calling it the year of clarity. Obviously, there's been a lot of heartache and a lot of things that have been um, have been unfortunate, but I, I do think there's been some positive in terms of perspective, in terms of these conversations we're now having and, and hopefully educating a population at whole in, in, in a positive way. Um, but we'd love to hear from you like during the, in 2020 so far, it's been a heck of a year. It feels like it's been 10 years all jammed into yeah. one, but um, what's the one positive thing you take away from it so far? Um, I think the concept of hindsight is 2020 has really resonated with me and the concept of the great pause, which was something that came out right at the beginning. Um, we had to pause for us to be able to face some of the social injustice, right? It couldn't be, well, I'm on vacation. I'll deal with that next time. And I'm really busy. And like, because of this pause, we were able to really face a lot of things, including personally and countrywide. Um, you know, I have two kids and it, it really helped me remember like the focal point of that as stressful as it was the first few right. months in homeschooling that, you know, that is like this, it gave us that moment to have family dinners every night and to, you know, cuddle on the couch every night. I'm not commuting anymore. And to really bring it back to that kind of component. And so to me, that's the major positive is keeping that balance and remembering that priority. Hannah, I'll, uh, I'll throw it to you. Yeah. I mean, I think as it relates to our brand too, you know, we've always been a brand that even though we're a beauty brand and, and hair is part of your appearance, we're, we've always been about 
feeling good and not about looking look, good. Look good, feel good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, you know, this year, you know, uh, on a personal and a professional level, um, I think like I've done a really like deep assessment of like, what are the things that really make us feel good? And, you know, one of them is human connection. Um, and we are not getting that at the same level that we used to. And so it can't be replicated, but how can we make up for the human connection that we're not getting? And like, what are some of the other simple pleasures in life that can make us feel really good? Is it baking a sourdough loaf for some people? Not, we never got around to that phase of quarantine, <laughs> but like, you know, or is it just going on a walk with your dog or like, you know, like we're, I, I especially, but I know almost everyone is so go, go, go all the time, traveling, meetings at the office. And so you try to get through a day, you try to plug through and order a sweet green and make it home and have a glass of wine and crash. And sometimes sweet green may yeah. not show up, you know, it's one yeah, of those exactly, things. Like today. <laughs> and, um, and so I think like, I've just become so much more aware of what makes me actually feel good. And, and what are the simple pleasures in life that I'm not enjoying when I'm so caught up with all the other noise. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, it's uh, on the last panel, uh, one panelist put it, it was the reset button on society, which I thought was a good way to put it yeah. um, in a lot of ways, right? Like reset on what are our priorities, perspective, what makes us happy, what makes you feel good, like Hannah said. So I, uh, you guys got me pumped up. I'm, I think I'm going to leave it on that. That was a, that was a good ending to all of this. But um, please go check out Way, uh, their website, t check out their products, but check them out on social specifically. Because like I said, I think 90% of the industry, in my opinion, um, has problems in terms of building those communities and really being genuine to their audience and you guys, or your consumer, I should say. And I think you guys do a tremendous job. So kudos to you and your, your entire team. And thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thanks, David. All right. Thanks, guys. See ya. Thank you so much to both Hannah and Aaron. Um, again, I, I think all of you got value out of that. There's no doubt. And again, uh, like we said at the top of the program, really want to dig into the community and what they're doing um, with not only their overall marketing and their customer service and things like that, what they're doing on you know website, but on social specifically as well. Um, well, some good... Uh, so they dropped some knowledge on us. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, they had a really interesting um, way of utilizing their social almost as like a tool. And I can't remember if it was Han or, Hannah or Aaron uh, who said that their Instagram is there to inform, to tell Hannah, you about the yeah. product or you can yeah. tell your friends about it. And then if you want to buy something, that's great. That's the icing on the cake. But it really serves as a platform to inform you about way and then kind of get you to where they want you to go. And I, I'm sure there's some of our listeners that are cringing of how lucky both Hannah and Aaron are because it starts with Jen Atkin. She has her own 3.5 million followers. She understood the power of social and building an audience and building a community. Um, there's a lot of brands out there that are like, why are we doing social? How much money do we make from it? And that's why I think you and I see a lot of brands um, out there that when you go to their Instagram, you go to their social, it's just ad, 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 ad. Or like Hannah mentioned, you know, every single video piece of video content are these highly produced commercials, which is being inauthentic to platforms, especially like a TikTok um, that is 100%, you know, uh, user generated content most, most times than not. So just being um, genuine to those platforms. But again, their leadership understands that. Therefore, they say, okay, we're going to build brand awareness. We're going to build a community. And if that leads to sales, that's great. But we're not going to have that be the only reason we do social, which is the, absolutely the right way to think about it. But there's some old school people at the top, like Hannah mentioned, if you have a, a CEO that doesn't get it or a board of directors that are very um, sales driven, they may just say, we don't even want to do social because we're not seeing every time we post, we don't get 17 sales. And I think the biggest testament to that is anyone you talk to about way, they instantly say how much they love the brand, how much they love the social, how yeah. much they love the product. I haven't heard one person say a bad thing about it. So yeah. they are definitely doing everything right. Yeah. And a lot of our female staff at STN, they're huge, huge fans. They were excited when they heard that we were going to talk to both Hannah and Aaron. So they, they have a great, um, it seems like they have a great quality product, but also that, that brand loyalty which you and I may have for yeah, Nike exactly. and the Lakers and things like that. Team Jordan all day long. Um, but uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. That was really awesome. And again, it was the first time that we've really dug deep into building a community and different ways to do that um, cross-platform. So that was really exciting for us to dig into. All right. Uh, thank you so much, as always, for taking the time out of your day to listen to the Business Social Podcast. As Will Kelly tells all of our employees to do, and 
I guess I could ask you, Will, out of out of our employees, what percentage has rated and reviewed the Business and Social Podcast? And you know, at the end of the day, should they be disciplined? Should they be disciplined if they have it? That's that's the question I ask myself. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. It should be a hundred, and if not, it better be quick. I've you know what I've thought about like doing a secret code in these podcasts. I think you and I should collab on this. We say secret code, right? The secret code mm-hmm. is, you know, purple goat. And if you're an employee of STN Digital and you're listening right now <laughs> and you email me and Will purple goat, then you will get a prize. And we'll see how many people email us. Are we getting the support internally for the business social podcast? Some of you and I are just working uh, our blood, sweat, and tears on. You, I, and Furker, excuse me. Yeah, the only people in the office right now. So uh, I yeah, mean, Purple Goat, I think, is a good uh, is a good. Purple Goat. Lead. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll, see. we'll, we'll give it a couple of weeks. Brand loyalty. We'll, go, we'll give it a couple loyalty. weeks, and then you have to email me, CC Will and Furker, and just say Purple Goat, and we know that you listen to this show. And we'll see. We'll see if we have the support, the loyalty, and respect of our colleagues here at STN Digital. I like that. <laughs> Random. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you so much uh, for listening. This has been another edition of the Business Social Podcast powered by SCN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley.